हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा प्रभु जी हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा ग्रेट प्रभु जी ऑल इज वेल हरे कृष्णा प्रभु हरे कृष्णा प्रभु हरे कृष्णा माता जी हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा टू एवरी वन प्लीज हरे कृष्णा प्रीति आप घर को जॉइन हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा फटाफट लग जाओगे ना प्रणामी मंत्र Okay. Anybody wants to do the invocation prayers? Right. Right. Can I do it, Prabhu Ji? Of course, you can. नम ओं विष्णुपदा कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदा स्वामी मे नमस्ते सरस्वती देव गौरवाणी पर चारने निर्वशेषा शून्यवादी चतु तारणे जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्रीअद्वैत गदाधार श्रीवासवादी गौर भक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 रामा हरे रामा राम रामा हरे हरे वंचाकल्प विचार कृपा सिंधु विचार पति तम पावन में वैष्णव नमो जय श्री कृपा की जय की की थैंक यू प्रभु अशोक कृष्णा प्रभु कैन आई गिव यू दी को होस्ट प्रिविलेजेस अशोक कृष्णा प्रभु कैन यू हियर मी ओके व्हेन ही कम्स So everyone, please try to keep yourself on mute, your video on, and yourself on mute. That's my preference, if that's possible at all. Please do that. Okay. So let's move on to today's program. But before I get uh, started with the class itself, uh, most of you may already know that um, this is uh, the Bhadra Mass. and the bhadra purnima is going to be on september 20th 20 september 20 in shivad bhagavatam it says that anyone who 
um, <coughs> gifts at Srimad Bhagavatam. On that day, is guaranteed a ticket to the spiritual world. So we have uh, uh, actually the, the Toronto Sankirtan came, and on their encouragement, I uh, produced a video on their behalf that they would be circulating. It's a one and a half minute video that I'd like to play today. And then I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about if there may be any interest in either acquiring a set for yourself or for a friend, or maybe sponsoring a set so we can give to some deserving family or person on your behalf. So if you'd allow me, I'd, I'd put that video on. That didn't work. Sorry, bear with me. No, oh, I'm sorry. Just bear with me. As you know, Srimad Bhagavatam is a book about Lord Krishna, his devotees, and his sweet loving relationship. The book Bhagavatam is not different from the person Bhagavatam, which is Lord Krishna himself. Every word in Srimad Bhagavatam is good for the society. The person benefits the spiritual. Hare Krishna Prabhu, we can't see video. We can see? We can see the WhatsApp screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on. Hold on. Thank you for letting me know. Sorry, Prabhu. Just give me a second. Also, audio was low, Prabhu. Okay, let me just see what I can do. Okay. Do you see the video at this time? No, okay. No. Okay, give me a second. Let me try one more time. Can you see it now? Yes, bro. Okay. We are seeing the YouTube. Okay, let's see. Hare Krishna. Can you see it? As you know. Yes, bro. Okay, thank you. Lord Krishna is the devotees. Sweet, loving relationship. Can't hear you, bro. Yeah. at all. Yeah. Different person, but try, try to increase the video voice. Person benefits the spiritual simply by holding. You can't hear it. No, Sabaji, should I try sharing my screen if you allow? If you would do that, yeah, let's see if we uh, okay, so you'll have to stop sharing. Happens to be a 
Is this any better? Yeah, it's much better. Hare Krishna. As you know, Shrimad Bhagavatam is a book about Lord Krishna, his devotees, and the sweet, loving relationship between them. The book Bhagavatam is not different from Person Bhagavatam, which is Lord Krishna himself. Every word in Shrimad Bhagavatam is good for the society. A person benefits spiritually simply by holding Shrimad Bhagavatam in his hand. Just reading one shloka makes one's life successful. Shrimad Bhagavatam is so potent that gifting it on the day of Bhadra Purnima, which happens to be on September 20th this year, makes one eligible to go to Goloka Vrindavan because Krishna blesses that person. So please, gift a set of Bhagavatam to someone you love. Alternatively, you could sponsor a set that we will gift on your behalf to a deserving family or person. Of course, if you do not have a copy, please get one for yourself. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Sonam. Uh, no problem. It was a little bit out of sync, but at least you could hear it. So the reason I wanted to show this is that this video is going to be circulated through people in Canada and basically encourage everyone to either acquire a set of Bhagavatam or buy it on behalf of a friend you can gift to or simply sponsor it and we will, uh, the team will uh, gift it to somebody on your behalf. So please consider and uh, let me know. You don't have to do this right now. Let me know if uh, there's any interest in acquiring it for yourself or for a friend or sponsoring it. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, it's, uh, this is what Srila Prabhupada wanted. Our, <clears throat> our uh, worldwide goal is 45,000 sets. And I think we're doing very, very well on that. I don't know the number that is uh, at present. I know that in Toronto, we have done 85 sets. In Vancouver, we have done 52 sets. So uh, um, there's a lot of interest. And I'm hoping that some of you would also be interested. Please let me know, either in sponsoring or acquiring for yourself or for a friend. And, or if you know a friend who, want, who may be interested, give us the contact information and we'll contact that person uh, for potentially <clears throat> acquiring one. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I hope that that diversion was not, <clears throat> not uh, too objectionable to any one of you. Okay, all right. So we'll move on to today's class. But before I do that, are there any questions from the previous week that you may have forgotten to ask or may have thought of later on? And we can cover that now. Okay. All right, that I'm going. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you may recall that where we left off was that Lord Krishna and Lord Balra had entered the wrestling arena and uh, uh, two, two of the wrestlers, uh, Chanur and Mushtik, had come up front to quote unquote welcome Krishna and Balram and uh, Chanur had challenged Krishna to fight him. So Lord Krishna and Lord Balram, they accepted their challenge and uh, so Chanur and Krishna were facing each other off, and Lord Balram and Mushtik were facing each other. Now, I don't know if any one of you has ever seen um, worldwide wrestling. Uh, at one time, it used to be very popular. I don't know if it's still popular. Anyway, where wrestlers fight in a, in a rink, and typically you will see that they, they clap their hands first against each other, you know, the gravity. and then they start hitting each other 
knees to knees and legs to legs on other parts of the body and head to head and those so on so forth. They keep doing that. So basically, this is what Krishna Balaam and Mushtik and Shanur were doing. They were uh, uh, striking their fists against their opponent's fists, you know, chest against chest, head against head, and all those kind of things. And they were dragging each other in circles, they were shoving and crushing each other, you know, they were throwing, you know, each other down, you know, pick them up and throw them down. You know, they would run behind the person or in front of the person, forcefully lift them and, you know, carry them to distance and whirl them and throw them again, push each other away and sometimes down, you know, hold each other down. I mean, the, the regular resting was going on and they were really hurting each other quite a bit and uh, it was going on for a while. And uh, the ladies in the arena who were watching, they thought it was really very violent. And uh, they basically felt disgusted at what was going on. So they started to condemn Kansa and all the members of Kansa's royal family. Now they're saying, this should never be allowed. A wrestling match between such huge wrestlers. I mean, their limbs are as tough as lightning bolts and they're the size of a mountain. And here are these two tender young boys. An intelligent person should never enter an assembly <clears throat> if they see some injustice like this being done. Now, what they were really saying was that, if you remember, every part of Krishna's body is compared to what? What flower? Anybody? Lotus. Lotus, exactly. So it's Kamal and Nayan, which is lotus-like eyes. Karakamal, what? Lotus-like hands. Padakamal, means what? Lotus feet, right? Uh, Padmanabha, means no. lotus navel. You know, and on and on. But the reason they compared with lotus is that Krishna's body parts are so soft. It's so soft. And, uh, and this, the girls, uh, women rather are saying, that what is this? These big wrestlers with limbs as tough as lightning bolts, they're fighting with little boys who are uh, uh, whose body parts are like as soft as lotus flower. And what, what is this going on? You know, and uh, try to visualize also. You know, you have some big Hulk Hogan guy, you know, uh, eight foot, nine, ten foot, I don't know, tall and probably weighs 400 pounds. And then you have this under 11 year old two kids. You know, how tiny would that be? And body as soft as butter as lotus flower and they're fighting. So these ladies were really complaining and Vasudevan so Devki heard that complaint and said, yeah, really, what's going on here? You know, uh, unfortunately, they were still you know, bound as in jail as uh, so they couldn't do anything about it, but they were also getting very disgusted. Anyway, but Krishna and Balaram, you know who they are. So their blows, you know, from their fists and other parts, other limbs were landing like crushing lightning bolts upon Chanur and, and Mushte. They were breaking every part of their body and causing them more and more pain and fatigue. So Chanur got really upset, very furious, and he rushed to Krishna and he attacked him with the speed of a hawk, Bhagavatam says. And struck his chest with both fists. Well, Krishna didn't even move. He didn't even move. He simply grabbed Chanu's arms and whirled him around a few times and then threw him to the ground. Killed him instantly. Lord Varnam did the same thing with Mushte. Dead. He basically, the way he did it was he, he used his palm and hit Mushtik um, uh, with his Bushtik. Bushtik. And Mushtik simply began vomiting blood, fell down, gone. Then there were other wrestlers like Kuta. Um, they came running, attacked Lord Balram. And Lord Balram, I mean, like nonchalantly, just very casually, hit him with his left paw and killed him. You know, it kind of reminded me when Lord Varadev 
killed Hiranyaksha. Does anybody remember how he killed him? Anybody remember how Lord Varadev killed Hiranyaksha? He simply with his hand went like this, gently. Mm -hmm. Broke his head, killed him. Just like that. So you can imagine if Lord Balaram, you know, did it forcefully, what would happen? Gone instantly. And then Krishna kicked another wrestler by the name of Shal. Kicked him on his head, finished. Another wrestler came, Toshal, and he literally tore him into half. I know, killed him. The remaining wrestlers, there were quite a few of them. You know what they did? They fled, they ran away in fear. They said, you know, better save our life. So only way we can do this is run away from the, from the ring. So this ran away. So it was finished. Everybody gone. Like all the wrestlers dead. So Krishna and Balaram then, you know, they basically looked up on the seats of arena and they called all their cowherd friends to join them. So they all came down. And they started a big dance. We call it, you may call it the wrestling dance, but they were dancing and they were playing. And, oh, somebody's not on mute. Hold on. Once again, I request that everybody please keep yourself on mute unless you need to speak. So video on, mute. Thank you so much. Anyway, so the dancing and here. There, you know, in those days, men wore ankle bells. So as they were dancing, the ankle bells were like playing the part of the musical instruments. They were dancing to the tune of whatever was coming up. I was big dance party right there in the arena. In the meantime, all these dead bodies are there. They don't care. They're just dancing away. But something very interesting happened. This is not a Shimad Bhagavatam, but it's elsewhere where Shidam. Anybody knows who Shidam is? Anyone? Radharani's brother. Correct. So Radharani's brother, he came to Krishna. And he looked at him, you know, like look at his eyes straight, face to face, nose to nose almost, and said, you cannot be Krishna. Who are you? And Krishna looked at him kind of strange. What are you talking about, Shidam? Of course I'm Krishna. What do you ask? And Shidam said, no, you know, Krishna that I know, I can defeat him in a wrestling match. And how can you defeat this mountain-sized demons? You got to be somebody else. But Krishna insisted, no, man, it's me, it's me, Krishna, your friend Krishna. Shidam said, the only way I would know is that I'm going to challenge you to a wrestling match and then see what happens. So Krishna said, okay, fine. So now Shidam and Krishna are wrestling against each other. And lo and behold, right in front of the whole audience, including Kansa, including all the residents of Vrindavan, Nand Baba, Yashoda Maharaj, all watching, Shidama picked up Krishna, threw him on the ground, flat on his back, Krishna is lying there. And you know what Shidama does? He stands up puts one foot on the chest of Krishna and goes like this. I won. I won. And then he says to Krishna, yes, you are Krishna. Now I can prove it. I agree, you are Krishna. So this is the mood of the, of the cow, cowherd friends of, uh, of Lord Krishna. You know, they, they only want their Krishna. They don't care about his power. They don't care about anything else. They just want their Krishna, their friend that they can play with, they can fight with, they can tease him, all those kind of things. Anyway, so when all this was going on, everybody was cheering Krishna and Balram, except for one person. Who would that be? Who's not happy in that arena? Kamsa. Yes, Kamsa is not happy. So he said, stop this music, stop the festivities. And he ordered his soldiers to arrest Vasudev, Nanda Maharaj, Ugrasen, who is his father-in-law, 
sorry, not father-in-law, uh, uncle, and all, I said, let all the cowherd boys, sorry, cowherd men and boys who have come from Vrindavan, kill them and drive these two boys, Krishna and Balaam, away from this assembly. Now when Krishna heard Gansa talk like that, he got really angry. And he leaped from the ground to the dais, which was quite high, where Gansa was sitting. He leaped up to that dais and he grabbed Gansa by the hair, hurled him down onto the floor of the wrestling ring and then threw himself on top of it, bearing the weight of all the universes. Immediately killed him. And then Krishna was so angry. He dragged Kansa's dead body along the ground in full view of everyone present, just like a lion would drag a dead elephant. Everyone in the arena was shocked. Oh, oh, what happened? But something else had happened very interesting. Now, Kansa, what were Kansa's last few years of life were like? He was so scared of Krishna coming, so much in fear that he was always thinking about Krishna. And I mean, with his drinking, with his eating, his moving around, or his sleeping, or simply breathing, he would always see the Lord Krishna. And he would see Krishna with this weapon in his hand. So because he was constantly thinking about Krishna, he gained the liberation of having a form like Krishna. Actually, his forehead form. It was called Sadhu Pima. And then, Kansas were eight brothers, they rushed to attack Krishna. Balram intervened and easily killed every one of them with his club. Of course, the demigods were very happy. They started playing the kettle drums and other musical instruments. Their wives started dancing, and raining down, literally raining down flowers, you know, chanting the glories of Krishna and Balram. Now, the wives of Kansa came. They were grieving for their husband. And they were lamenting. I mean, they were good ladies. They were lamenting that their husband died because of his violence towards all the other living entities. And because of his lack of respect for Krishna, the Supreme Soul. This is the Supreme Soul who creates, who maintains, who destroys the entire universe. And my husband, or our husband had no respect for it. So the Lord went to them. Krishna went to them and consoled them. And he arranged for all the funeral rites to be performed properly for concerns brothers, you know, and then made arrangements to release his mother, biological mother and father, which is, well, biological only in the mundane sense. Uh, was they were to be released from jail. And actually, Krishna actually, Krishna Balram actually went to the jail. Where upon seeing them, up, seeing the parents, that is, they both offered their obeisances to the parents. But when Vasudev and Devaki saw Krishna coming in, they ran to them. Krishna and Balram. They ran to them. But halfway through, they stopped. Because they remembered that, wait a minute, this is Supreme Personality of God. And they simply froze in place and stood there with joined palms and ready to offer prayers. And they did not embrace Krishna and Balram, even though they were their sons. So now compare that to the Yashoda Maya. What would Yashoda have done if she had seen Krishna and or Balram coming towards her? Anyone? They would have hugged. Exactly. They would have stopped halfway. They would run and hug. Probably hug very hard too. Now squeeze it. Because to Yashoda, it was just her lalla, her little boy. But Vasudeva Devki had seen the Vishnu form of Krishna before he turned to baby. So they remembered that. So therefore, suddenly the formality. You know, this Supreme Personality of God, and how do I hug him? I need to offer my obeisances. 
And that's the difference between the mood of Vishdeva Devaki and Nandaneshwara. Okay, anyway, I'm going to pause, see if there are any questions or comments or objections. Anyone? You can hear me, right? Yes, Prabhu. Okay, good. Just wanted to be sure. Okay, so now the scene changes. Sorry, not yet. Let me go back. Let me go back to jail cell. Uh, Krishna and Balaram are noticing the hesitation on the part of their parents to embrace them. So Lord Krishna said, okay, time for yoga maya. Come on, yoga maya. Come on and make them think that they're their children and not, not God. So immediately yoga maya did her thing and Krishna Devaki forgot that they are that their children are gods and they approached them and hugged them. Now, Krishna said, My dear parents, how unfortunate it was that because of us, as Krishna and Balara, you, you being Vasudeva Devaki always remained in anxiety and you could never enjoy our childhood. We were not with you. Not just childhood, nor could you enjoy our boyhood or our youth. And for us too, we could enjoy the pampering that normal children receive from their parents because we were not with you. And then Krishna said, even in a lifetime of 100 years, no son can ever repay the debt he owes his parents. Parents from whom he receives his body. But he said, anyone who fails to support his parents will be forced to eat his own flesh after death. Very strong. Anyone who fails to support his parents will be forced to eat his own flesh after death. I said, not just that. Actually, any person who does not maintain and nourish those people who are under his care. So for example, children, wife, my spiritual master, elderly parents, and so on and so forth. That person is like a living corpse. And he said, Actually, it was out of the fear of Kansa that we, we, Krishna and Balram, could not serve you. So now please forgive us. We are here to serve you from now on. When Vasudeva and Devaki heard these words from Krishna, they were, you can imagine the emotions they were feeling. They were overcome with emotion, totally overwhelmed. And this time, they actually hugged Krishna and Balram very tightly. But as they were doing that, the clothes that Krishna and Balaram were wearing and any body parts that were exposed were totally wet. Totally wet from what? I need interactive, so I just need you to respond. Tears. Yes. With the tears. 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 The ecstatic tears of a stable day. Okay. Now, still going on, Lord Krishna then offered Kansa's kingdom to his maternal grandfather, whose name was Ugrasen. And he told him that it was the curse of Yayati that no Yadu can sit on the throne. Does anyone know that story? Should, because we covered it. I need to hear from somebody. He said, yeah, I remember. And this is what happened. So I'll give you two names, Yayati and Yadu. Nobody? Okay. So you may recall Yayati had married the daughter of Shukracharya, who brought with her a maid who actually was a 
princess with her and told her husband Yayati to always be faithful to her, Devyani. But Devyati ended up having liaison with uh, Sharmishta also, who was the maid servant. And Devyani became very upset, went back to her father, complained about the lack of uh, faithfulness on the part of her husband. Shukrachar cursed Yayati to become very, very old. Yayati was very repentive, repent, repent, Repentful, what's the word? Repenting, repentful, repetitive, I don't know, something like that. Basically, he was repenting that he made a mistake. So he apologized, and Shukracharya said, Well, I can't take my curse back. However, if you can get somebody to take your old age in exchange for his youth, then you can enjoy your life. So Yadu was the oldest son of Yayati. So he went to him first, said, will you please exchange your youth for my old age? He said, no. And then there were three other children who also said, no. Finally, the youngest one, whose name was Puru, said, okay, fine. I'll do that. So Yayati had cursed all the other four children that your descendants will never sit on the throne. So this is the curse that Krishna is reminding. Uh, Ugra saying that, look, I cannot be just get don't think about asking me. I cannot sit on the throne. So you have to sit. And then he arranged for all his family members. You know, remember everybody had from Yadu dynasty and other dynasties belonging to Krishna or relatives of Krishna that run away from their homes in fear of Kansa. He arranged for all the other people to come back. And uh, they all did. And protected by Krishna and Balram, they had great time. Basically, Bhagavatam says, they enjoyed supreme bliss. Anyway, and then Krishna and Balram approached Nanda Maharaj and praised him, not thanked him, praised him for having cared so lovingly for them. And Krishna said, my dear father, we had been abandoned by our parents because they could not maintain and protect us out of fear of concern. So you and Yashoda Maya are our real father and mother. You cared for us as you would care for your own sons. And then Krishna added, dear father, he's talking to Nanda Maharaj, dear father, please return to Vraja. I know, I know Balaram knows how much you and other relatives are and will suffer, are suffering and will suffer in separation from us. So therefore, Balram and I will come back to see you as soon as we have satisfied your friends here in Mathura. And then Krishna actually worshipped Nanda Maharaj with various offerings. Nanda Maharaj was feeling totally overwhelmed with the love for his sons, Krishna and Balram. And he tearfully embraced Krishna and Balram and then he took the coward men who had come with him and departed for Vraja. So now they are gone. Now Vasudev called his priests. Now this is a few days later. Called his priests to perform the second birth ritual, which is like Duja ceremony, which is the sacred threat ceremony for Krishna. After that, Krishna and Balaam went to Garbhamuni, the Kul Guru, and took the vow of celibacy. And then, it's very interesting the way Bhagavatam puts it. It says, Krishna and Balaam are omniscient, which means they know everything. Krishna says in uh, Bhagavad Gita, he says to Arjun, Vedaham Samtitani, Vartamanani Arjun. He says, I know everything. I know the past, I know the present, I know the future. And I know all the living entities. I know what's going on in everybody's head. So Bhagavad says, even though Krishna and Balram are omniscient, but they desired to reside at the school of a spiritual master. This is to teach the rest of the population. And they went to live with a spiritual master by the name of, who was telling me? What is the name of the guru whose place they lived in? 
ಉಪನಿಷತ್ಸ್ and whatever else other arts basically 64 different subjects and needed only one day per subject so 64 days they learn 64 traditional arts and they knew it all as if they had been practicing it for years well you would expect that from krishna and brother anyway at the end of 60 days 64 days it was time to leave but there's one uh custom that one must follow before their education is complete it's called guru dikshana dikshana yes yeah, that's great guru dikshana so they went to the teacher. guru diksha no guru dikshana dikshana sorry so yeah. so they went to him and said what can we give you for guru dikshana so sandeepani muni consulted his wife came back and said some time ago our son had gone to a place called prabhas and he never came back so can you please get him back for us so krishna said okay so they got on a chariot krishna and balram both they went to prabhas chit with the ocean is there and they sat on the shore of the ocean they had sat only for a few minutes maybe that ocean personified showed up with folded hands and when i read that i smiled and my reaction was oh so he learned his lesson <clears throat> so i'd like to tell me i'd like you to tell me what lesson i may have been thinking about lord ram yes exactly <laughs> you may recall lord ram had actually performed the austerities fasted for 3 days the ocean didn't show up too puffed up to show up then he got punished so he remembered that he said ah uh-uh, ah i'm showing up right away i'm not taking any chances anymore he showed up and this place said how may i serve you so krishna said tell tell the told the whole story about the son of his guru i said please return um return the son of my guru the ocean said actually i don't have it there is a demon dwelling within this ocean his name is panchjal he had taken the boy away so you have to get it from him so krishna heard that he entered the ocean found this demon panchjal and killed him and he took the shell that had grown from his body and that's the the conchjal that krishna used later on and therefore it was named as very obvious name panchajanya panchajanya so that's how that name came so can you you can imagine the size of the council that krishna was using um anyway so <coughs> excuse me and he after killing the demon krishna searched the belly of the demon but he didn't find it it wasn't there so then he went to the planet of yamraj 
Kuzi Amaraj, the Lord of Death. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, when he got there, Krishna blew his energetic conch shell. It is said that upon hearing Lord Krishna's conch shell, all the residents of Yamaloka were liberated. So imagine what perfect timing. You're in hell. Suddenly Krishna shows up, blows his, his uh, conch shell, and you're all liberated. Anyway, when Yamaraj heard that conch shell, he knew who, it is, who was playing this. He came forward immediately and very deportedly, very humbly worshipped Krishna. And I asked Lord Krishna, how may I serve you? Krishna said, I would like you to return my Guru's son. So immediately Yamaraj went back, brought the son of uh, Sadipati Muni and presented to Krishna. So they returned to their spiritual master and presented him, presented him with his son. And then they said, please, my dear spiritual master, ask for another favor. We want to give you more good action. So Sandipani Muni said, you know, when a guru obtains a disciple or disciples like you, that's all the guru dakshana he can ask for. So all my desires are fulfilled. I don't want anything else. So Nipanyani blessed them and, and instructed them to go home. So Krishna and Balaram went home to Mathura. And you can imagine, 64 days the citizens didn't have the association of Krishna and Balaram. For 64 days, they did not see their beautiful faces. You can imagine the ecstasy they were feeling when they returned. And uh, so there were obviously big celebrations for the return of Krishna and Balaram from the house of Bindu. I'm going to pause again because I'm going to change the topic completely now. Any questions or comments? No? Okay, all right, then I'll keep going. <clears throat> so one day, now remember, Krishna is now in, Krishna and Balram are in Mathura. So one day Lord Krishna asked his very intimate friend and cousin, whose name was, who was the famous cousin of Krishna? Udav. Udhava, yes. Udhava. Udhava, who was a disciple of Vespati. And he said, Udhava, I want you to go to Braja. And I want you to meet my relatives, including my parents, and all the cowherd boys and girls, and give them the news of my welfare. Because they are very, very miserable due to separation from me. So hearing the news about me Will relieve, them, will relieve them of the misery caused by their separation from them. <laughs> and he said, the minds of those gopis are always absorbed in me. Their lives are fully devoted to me. And you know, Dhava, for my sake, they abandoned everything. Everything related to their bodies. Their family, their you know, children, husbands, etc., and anything else they possess. They renounce the mundane, ordinary happiness of life. Not just that, they also gave up any religious duties which will bring them happiness in the next life. They gave it all up. I'm their most beloved person. Actually, you know what? I'm their soul. For these women, and the most cherished object of love. So what happens? When they remember me, they're overwhelmed by the anxiety of separation because I'm so far away. And you know, the, they struggle. They actually struggle to maintain their lives somehow or the other. Why? Because, simply because I promised to return to them. So they're keeping themselves alive 
because they don't want me to suffer when I go back and not find them there. So somehow they're keeping themselves alive so that they'll be there to receive me when I do go back. Now, it's not in Srimad Bhagavatam, but it's mentioned elsewhere. And when Gurudeva heard that, he said, okay, no problem, I'll go there. And he was thinking, you know, <clears throat> he'll preach to the gopis and other people, you know, about, oh, we're not this body and all those kind of things. And Gurudeva uh, was so intelligent, so knowledgeable that Krishna used him as his consultant. So I used to ask Uddhava, so what should I do now? That's the level of intelligence Uddhava had. So he was thinking, <clears throat> it will be easy. He found out otherwise, we'll talk about that in a second. But he asked a question. He said to Krishna, well, how will I recognize your house where your parents are living? And Krishna gave a wonderful answer. He said, Uddhava, you'll have no problem. As you drive your chariot along the lanes, the gali on the lanes of, uh, of Vraja, look for a house from where rivers are flowing out, rivers of water are flowing out. And that was kind of puzzled. So I said, My parents, Nanda Shoda, are crying so much. Torrents of the tears, the shedding constantly from the river that you will see. So Dhava accepted Krishna's uh, uh, instructions, he took his message for the parents and the gopis, and he left for Vrija on his chariot. He reached there at sunset. A beautiful description given uh, in Srimad Bhagavatam talks about you know, what did Uddhav see when he got there? Well, he saw cows are returning home from the pastures, and the calves are in front of them, jumping here and there, and uh, the mother cows slowly following them behind. Um, the cowherd men, cowherd women, they're chanting the glories of Krishna and Balaram, and the whole village. Very nicely decorated because why did they decorate? Because they were not sure when Krishna will come back. So every day they will decorate the whole house, sorry, whole town, whole village or the villages. And you know, proper decoration, Diwali kind of decoration because oh, Krishna might come tomorrow, Krishna might show up today. So they were ready every day for Krishna's return. They were burning the incense and bows of lamps like Diwali celebrations, you know, all that he noticed. And then he was looking for a house from where the rivers are flowing. He got there in no time. He stopped there, got off. Nanda Maharaj welcomed the Dhamma very nicely, very warmly. And actually worshipped him as if he's not different from Krishna. Fed him very nicely, gave him a very nice, comfortable seat uh, to sit on. And then when his fatigue was done, he inquired from Uddhava the welfare of Vasudev, Krishna, and Balaram. And he said, Oh, I should point out, Nanda Maharaj did not complain to Uddhava, look what my children did. This is what these days children do. You, you give them birth, you raise them, you do so many sacrifices for them. And they just take off. They don't care. He didn't complain about anything like that. Instead, what he asked was, Uddhava, does Krishna remember us? Does he remember his mother? What about his friends? Does he remember them? Does he remember his well wishers? Does he remember the cowherd boys and girls? Does he remember the village of Vrindavan? Does he remember the cows? Does he remember the Govardhan Hill? Does he remember, you know? all the games he played, all the pastimes he had. And then he said, Uddha, will Krishna ever return even once to see his family? All we want to do is, if he ever does return, we would love to glance upon his beautiful face, with his beautiful eyes, beautiful nose, 
and a gorgeous, 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 sweet smile. That's all he said. And then Nanda Maharaj started to remember all the past times. And he said to Uddhav, you know, Uddhav, Krishna protected us from the forest fire, from wind and rain, we are to Govardhan Leela, and many other disasters. And you know, we sit here and we are constantly remembering those past times again and again and again. And by doing that, we you know we are relieved of all karmic entanglements and you know when we see those places marked by his feet his lotus feet our minds become fully absorbed in the thoughts of Krishna then the Maharaj said you know Garbuni told me that Krishna and Balram both descended directly from the spiritual world because you can see how easily did they dispatch Kansa, the wrestlers, the elephant, Kavaliyaki, and so many other demons. And as he was saying all this, as he was remembering these pastimes, his throat choked up, eyes were filled with tears, and he just couldn't talk anymore. Nainam Gadgad Galiya Ashadhariya Gadgad Rudhyagya Sikshastakam that Lachitan talks about, that was happening to Nanda Maharaj. Tears in eyes, voice completely choked. Can't say a word. He couldn't speak one more word. Meanwhile, Mother Shuddha was listening, hearing all this. Uh, her husband talked about Krishna and his pastimes. So she came running. And she too was feeling such intense love for Krishna, that the milk from her body was flowing in front of her and wetting her sari and making the path in front of her totally muddy. The milk and the tears from her eyes were being mixed, uh, causing this muddy pathway that fortunately she did not slip on. And she came and started looking at, at uh, Uddhav with great affection because he was the bearer of good news. He had seen Krishna and was going to tell them how Krishna was. So Uddhava noticed the super excellent affection that Nanda and Shoda had for Krishna. Like this was a brand new realization for Uddhava. So he said, he said to Nanda and Shoda, you two are so glorious. Actually, you're most glorious. You know, you have attained the pure love for the supreme absolute truth, Krishna, who is here in his human-like form. Therefore, you have nothing further to accomplish. You got the ultimate. That's the pure love for Krishna. And he said, Krishna and Balram are present in the hearts of all living beings, just like the fire is dormant in the wood. And these two lords, Krishna and Valra, they see everyone equally. Again, Samoham, Sarubhutana. They have no particular friends or enemies. They have no father, no mother, no wife, no children, and they're not subject to birth and death. They have no material body. But simply to enjoy the spiritual happiness of himself, his happiness, and the happiness of his pure devotees. And to deliver them from the material world, he appears by his own sweet will. And not necessarily always in human form, any form, any species of life. Sometimes high, sometimes low, but they appear simply to give pleasure to his pure devotees. And he said, my dear sir, and madam, Nanda Maharaj Nishwada, that Krishna is not merely your son, but son of all persons. But at the same time, he's also the mother and father of everyone. Pitaham is Jagato, Mata, Dhata, Pitama. Actually, if, if you ask for the truth, the fact is, Krishna is everyone's 
dearest relative. And then Uddhava said, I assure you, Nanda Maharaj and Yashoda Maya, Krishna will return to Gurja and satisfy you and all the residents of Gurja. And they spent the whole night, Nanda Maharaj, Yashoda, and Uddhava, spent the whole night talking about Krishna. You know what Krishna was doing in Mathura and what Krishna was doing in Gurja. Ah, they kept exchanging these stories. Well, it was almost dawn. So like, you know, some of us devotees, you know, the, the Tahoe women would wake up just before dawn. They start performing their morning worship. And then they start churn butter. And what do they do when they churn butter? Or anything. Same thing. They sing the glories of Krishna. So they were doing that. When the sun rose, everybody else you now was up and about. They came out of their houses and gopis saw Uddhava's chariot at the edge of the village. And you know what's the first thought that they occurred to them? That, oh, Akura is back again. And they said, oh, maybe Akura brought back Krishna. So they got excited. And just then, Uddhava finished his morning duties in the, in the house and he came out of the house and he presented himself before the gopis. I'm going to pause again and see if there are any comments, questions, corrections, anything you wish to add that I missed. No? Yeah, Prabhuji, I, I have this question. Thank you, Prabhu. Yeah, Buddha was, uh, uh, this was the first visit to Vrindavan, Buddha was, but he, was born, he was brought up in Mathura. Is that... Uh, that's how we understand Uddhava. So Uddhava appeared in Mathura, but he spent a lot of time with Brihaspati, so not in Mathura. Okay. But he had never been to Braja, that is correct. Okay, you first time. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? It's not confusing, is it? When nobody asks anything, I get worried that maybe I'm confusing everybody or doing my thing, putting everybody to sleep. Yes, no? Any reaction? No, it's an enchanting, Prabhuji. Just the flow. Thank so you, Prabhu. All going back and you are taking us back and trying to little bit up with your brain or trying to understand what could be there, how they must be releasing and how Nanda Baba and Yasuda Maya and Buddha uh, are thinking. You know, we can just... Think a little bit up, you know, not a, can't understand, but a little bit. Yes, Prabhu, thank you very much for saying that. Yeah, yeah thank you for taking through the memory lane. You, know? you can only relish these stories if you try to visualize and try to put ourselves in the situation of these you know, different uh, personalities, you know, how they are feeling. Then only we'll really enjoy these pastimes. Otherwise, just the story. Okay, so they noticed the gopis, this Uddhava coming out, uh, and he was wearing yellow garments with beautiful earrings. I guess earrings were very common in those days for men to wear. So first gopis thought that it was Krishna, and they were so happy. And then they said, no, it's not Krishna, but somebody really resembling Krishna. So they said, who is this? So they approached Uddhava, Basically, encircled him. And then they realized that, uh, oh, Krishna must have said this person. So, very eagerly, very uh, enthusiastically, uh, very happily, they took him to this uh, secluded place, which is now famous as Uddhav Kyari. Has anybody been there by, that, by the way? Has anybody been to Uddhav Kyari? which is in Nandagaon, not very far from the house of Nand Maharaj. It's a beautiful place. So if you haven't been there, next time you go to Vrindavan, please make a trip. We had been there probably. Have you been there, Mahajan That's great. Yes, probably. Yeah. So you know I'm not making this up, right? Okay, so they took him to Uddhav Kyari and uh, they felt that 
this was secluded enough that they can speak confidentially without the villagers finding out what they said. So they all sat down. Just imagine the scene. Uddhav is sitting and in front of him in circles, all the gopis are sitting. So how did they start? The gopis were not like Nanda Maharaj and Shoda. They started complaining. They started complaining how Krishna had abandoned them. Um, and they said, Krishna is just like a bee, honeybee or bumblebee. What does bumblebee do? Goes to a flower, drinks the nectar, abandons it, goes to the next flower. So they compared him to bumblebee. Then they compared Krishna to a prostitute. What does a prostitute do? Shows a lot of interest in one man, but as soon as the money is gone, abandons that man. Then they compared him to subjects of a king. What do the subjects of a king do? As soon as they realize king is incompetent, they throw him out. The students, they abandon their teacher as soon as their education is complete. And the birds abandon a tree as soon as the fruits of the tree are gone. So they're basically comparing a Krishna with a bumblebee, with a prostitute, with a uh, uh, subjects that uh, abandon the king, the students who abandon the teachers, and the birds who abandon the tree. They're so upset. But then the gopis started to remember the pastimes they enjoyed with Krishna. Now, understand that these gopis are very shy normally, very, very shy. They wouldn't speak to another man about their time with Krishna. But they, they left all their shyness out. And they started to remember loudly the past times they had enjoyed with Krishna. And, you know, they forgot about all the ordinary propriety, uh, shyness and customs and traditions and the rules of the society. They forgot it all. And they started crying very loudly. And Bhagavatam says one gopi, but actually it means Radhara. And you know that it says one gopi because Shukadeva Goswami did not want to utter the name of Radha. Or he will go to trance for seven days, and that will be the end of uh, Prashit Maharaj and no Bhagavatam. So he says one gopi. But Agni Puran makes it very clear no, that's Radhara. So anyway, so this. Radharani was deeply meditating on her association with Krishna. And it just so happened that at that very time she noticed a bumblebee in front of her. And she imagined that this bumblebee was a messenger from Krishna. So she started talking to this bumblebee. And she spoke words that are now popularly known as anyone? Brahmargi. Exactly. They're known as Brahmargi. And she said, just as the bees wander among various flowers, Krishna has abandoned us young girls of Raja and developed affection for other women of Mathura. And she said, I cannot understand why Lakshmi is still with him worshipping his lotus feet when he's going with all these women. And then she answered herself. She said, oh, Krishna must have deceived her with these sweet words. So poor, innocent, naive woman, she's still there. And then Radharani started to lament that we, and we being herself and her, her gopi friends, we gave up our homes to love Krishna. And what did Krishna do? He left us and became a prince in Mathura. I mean, what complaint? Now, apparently, this is just my, my speculation, that at this time the bee started to hover around her feet. And she said very quickly, hey, Keep your head off my feet. Keep your head off my feet. I know what you do. You exp 
expertly learned this diplomacy from Mukunda or Krishna. And now you have come as his messenger with flattering words. But it's not going to work. Your Krishna, your master Krishna, start with a B. Your master Krishna abandoned those who for his sake alone gave up their parents, their husbands, their children and all other relations. You know, he's simply ungrateful. And why should I make up with him now? And she continued talking this way. She said, she continued, you poor messenger, telling the B, you poor messenger, you're only a less intelligent servant. You don't know that much about Krishna, your master. He is so ungrateful. He is so hard-hearted. And you know what? This is not now. This is not the first time. Life after life after life in the, in the, uh, in the past has been exactly like that. Ungrateful and hard-hearted. And then she started giving an example. Like when he came as Ramchandra. As Lord Ramchandra, he killed Wali. But he killed him not like two soldiers fighting. He killed him like a hunter who hides behind a tree and then kills the animal without facing it. I mean, Ramchandra should have fought Wali face to face. But instigated by his friend Sugriv, he killed him from behind a tree. He deviated from religious principles of Kshatriya. And not only just that time, another time when Shubhnaka, the sister of Ravana came and she made that offer of marriage to Ram as a Kshatriya, he should have accepted it. But he was so attracted by the beauty of his own wife Sita that he converted beautiful Shubhnaka into an ugly woman by cutting off her nose and ears. I mean, here was Shubhnaka proposing a marriage to him. But Ramchandra was so henpecked that he did not forget Sita Devi. And this is what he did. Shubhnaka turned into an ugly woman. And that wasn't the only time either. Before that, he, was, he appeared as a Brahmin. His name was Vamana Deva at that time. And he asked for charity, three steps of charity for Bali Maharaj. Bali Maharaj was so magnanimous, he gave him everything he had. And still, Krishna as Vamana Deva was so ungrateful. He arrested him like a crow. And he pushed him down to the lower planet Sutala. So we all know, we know all about Krishna. He's so ungrateful. She is so ungrateful. But, my dear B, here's the difficulty. That's my problem. My problem is, in spite of Krishna being so cruel, so hard-hearted, it's very difficult for me, and actually for us, all of us, to give up talking about him, to forget him, to throw him out of our mind, get him out of our heart. We just cannot do that. We're not able to do that. That's our problem. This continued more. We took Krishna's words as true, as truth. And in the process, we became just like the deer's foolish wives. So what do the wives of deer do? They trust a hunter's song and music. And they become so mesmerized, they stand there, literally stand there, stunned, listening to that music, and they get killed by the sharp arrows of his hunt. So similarly, we repeatedly felt the sharp pain of lust caused by the touch of Krishna's nails. And here we are. So please, my dear messenger, you be, please talk about something besides Krishna. We want to talk about something else. Well, of course, there is nothing else but Krishna for Radharani and the Gopis. So while Radharani was talking with the bee, suddenly the bee disappeared from her sight. 
tu notes ça, c'est comme si. Radharani was in full mourning due to separation from Krishna, but she was feeling so much ecstasy by talking with the bee. But when the bee disappeared, Radharani went mad. She went mad. And she was thinking, oh, 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 the messenger must have gone back to Krishna and informed him about all the things that I'm saying. And all the things I'm saying against him, all the names I'm calling him. And you know what? My Krishna must be so sorry to hear all this. Now she was overwhelmed with a whole different kind of ecstasy. What have I done? I've given this sadness, this hurt to Krishna. What have I done? Well, as she was thinking like that, the bee appeared again. And Narayana thought, oh, Krishna is still kind to me. In spite of my harsh words, instead of what I said, He's so kind that he's again sent this bee to take me to him. The bee has come back to take me to him. So Radharani said to the bee, my friend, I should honor you. So please choose whatever benediction you want. I'll give it to you. But the doubts came to her mind again. She asked, why have you come back? So tell me again, why have you come back? Are you here? Take us to him. Why should we go? He's already married so many girls. Or well, not married. Yeah, he's already got so many girlfriends in Mathura. And Lakshmi is with him also. You know, staying on his chest. So why should we go? Like totally confusing. And then she calmed down a little bit. And she turned to Uddhava. And she asked. Same question that the gopis had asked earlier. She said, does Krishna ever remember his friends and his relatives in Vrindavan? And actually there's a comment in the purport by Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti who says at this time Radharani was thinking, actually more like hoping that Krishna will tell all these girls in Mathura that being with you, this being with you being the girls of Mathura, being with you is just not the same thing as being with those girls in Vrindavan. You know, I'm missing those beautiful garlands they used to make for me. I'm missing those sweet conversations we used to have. I'm missing all those playful things we did together. So you know what, girls? I'm going back to Vrindavan in the morning. And then Krishna will come back. Come back here in Vrindavan. And he'll place his hand on our heads. He'll wrap his arms around our necks and our waist. And he'll console us. He will say, Oh beloved, oh my heart, I swear to you, I swear to you, I will never abandon you again. I will never go anywhere else. And you know, indeed, I have not been able to find anyone in all the three worlds who has even a trace of your good qualities. So she's thinking of that. There's also another comment in the purport that the, some authorities, Acharyas, they say, actually, that B was indeed a messenger. Sorry, not a messenger. Krishna himself assume the form of a bee as the messenger. So, some of the acharyas said that it was really a bee, it was Krishna himself. Anyway, so Uddhava heard all this and he tried to console the gopis and he explained. He said, listen, ordinary people must perform many, many pious deeds for many, many lifetimes to qualify as servants of the Krishna. But you, you are simple cowherd girls. You are so extremely fortunate that you have, you have established an unexcelled, something that has never been excelled, like nothing above this. You have established an 
unexcelled standard of pure devotion for Krishna. That's a standard that even the sages can hardly attain. He's saying, in other words, the Lord has favored you with the very highest degree of pure devotion for him. And then Dhava passed, paused. And he started to relate the message that Krishna had given him for these gopis. And he said, now he's quoting Krishna. He's saying, you, he's saying to the gopis, you are never really separated from me. He's telling the gopis, Krishna is saying to the gopis, you're never really separated from me. Why? Because I'm the soul of the entire creation. I'm the supreme shelter of all. It's just as the elements, ether, air, fire, water, etc., they're present in everything that's created in the material world. Just like that, I am present within everyone's mind, everyone's life here, everyone's senses. <clears throat> By my potencies, I create, I maintain, and I destroy the cosmos. So I'm indeed the most dear personality to you, gopis. But even on that, or even at that, to increase your attraction for me even more and intensify your remembrance of me even more, I left you. Just say, I'm going to say this again. I know I'm very, very dear to you, like extremely dear to you. But I wanted to increase your attraction even more than present. I wanted to intensify your remembrance of me even more than present. To do that, I left you. After all, when a woman's beloved is far away, she fixes her mind upon him constantly. And my dear gopis, by incessantly remembering me, you're sure to regain my association without delay. So he's giving the assurance. Because you constantly remember me, incessantly means nonstop. You constantly remember me, you're sure to regain my association. And by the way, achira, without delay. It happened very, very soon. So you can imagine the, the joy, the happiness the gopis felt when they heard that. So they asked Uddhava, is Krishna happy now? Is Krishna happy now that Kansa is there? And he can enjoy the company of his family and all the women of Mathura? Does he still remember the past times? I mean, this is the third or fourth time they asked the same question. Does he still remember all the pastimes he enjoyed with us? Does he remember the last dance we did? Will Krishna once again appear before us and give us that same ecstasy? Just as Indra, with his rain, gives life back to the forests that are suffering from the summer heat? Will Krishna give us that same kind of relief? Because our hearts are parched as well. Our summer is that separation of, from Krishna. And then they said, listen, we know, we know that the, the greatest happiness comes from renunciation. But I'm sorry to tell you, we're sorry to tell you, we simply cannot hoping to attain Krishna. We simply cannot hope, sorry, cannot stop hoping to attain Krishna. And it gets made worse because we see these marks of his lotus feet everywhere throughout the land of Britain. Those footmarks remind us of his graceful walk, his generous smiles, his gorgeous smiles, sweet smiles, and his words that are sweeter than honey. So in the middle of all that, how can we stop hoping to attain Krishna one more time? All these things have stolen our heart away. Krishna has stolen our heart away. How can we stop hoping to attain or see Krishna one more time? And having said this, 
the gopis started loudly chanting krishna's names oh govinda please come and destroy our suffering oh mukunda oh krishna please come and destroy our suffering and they said crying very loudly they didn't care now who heard them cry or heard them shout krishna's name so uddhava with great difficulty pacified the gopis with some beautiful assurances and statements that dispel their pain of separation physical assurance of meeting again and then they turned around and worshiped um, uddhava as if he was not different from krishna so uddhava actually stayed in braja for several months and he gave a lot of pleasure to the residents by reminding them about krishna in different ways and they were very happy with that uddhava was also very satisfied at seeing the extent of gopi's love for krishna so much so that he actually declared that these girls have perfected their lives by coming to the platform of pure unalloyed love for krishna he said even brahma is inferior to these gopis the goddess of fortune herself who always resides on krishna's chest is inferior to them and she could not get the same mercy as the gopis have obtained especially during the ras dance lakshmi never never has krishna putting his neck sorry his arms around her neck krishna never embraces lakshmi his gopis have got all that so lakshmi doesn't have it brahma doesn't have it what to speak of other women or other anyone and then he says i would not that was talking about himself that i would consider myself most fortunate take birth as even a bush or a creeper that would sometimes be touched by the dust of this gopi's lotus feet uddhava the most intelligent the most highly educated the person who came thinking he's going to preach to the gopis has in preached so well that now he desires to be a creeper or a blade of grass in vrindavan so that the dust of the lotus feet of the gopis may fall upon him and that was thinking god as lakshmi can worship the lotus feet of krishna only within her mind but during the ras dance that krishna placed his feet his lotus feet upon this gopi's breasts removing all their distress completely and then he said to himself i repeatedly offer my respects to the dust from the lotus feet of these gopis when they loudly chant the glories of krishna that vibration purifies the three worlds and samacharya has actually mentioned that uddhava did not offer any such respect even to the queens of dwarka the way he did to the gopis of vrindavan that's the glory of the gopis anyway Finally, Uddhava got permission from Nand Maharaj and other cowherd men of half of Vrindavan, uh, of Vrija, I should say, uh, to go back to Mathura. Nand Maharaj gave him lots of gifts for not just for Krishna, but also for for Ugrasen and for Vasudev, and uh, and pray to Uddhava to please give the ability to always remember Krishna. Then Uddhava, for his obeisances, said his goodbyes. 
returned to Mathura, met Krishna, Balram, Ugnasen, etc. Vasudeva Devaki offered them the gifts that Venom had to send for them and then described all that he had experienced in Vraja and, and the realization that the biggest Kiani person so knowledgeable and so intelligent and so wise that Krishna would consult him and ask him, so what do I do now? Would get such a lesson from these uneducated, simple, naive girls known as gopis. And their only qualification was the pure love in their heart for Krishna. That's what gave them the ability. That's what gave them the wisdom. That's what gave them the the qualification to educate an educated person like Uddhava. Proving the point that mundane education has no value in front of the love one can feel in their heart for Krishna. In front of the unalloyed devotional feelings one can develop for Krishna. In front of the pure devotional service one can perform for Krishna. In front of anything we can do to please Krishna, the mundane education, the mundane wisdom stands no chance, no comparison to what Uddhava called the never before excelled unalloyed loving feelings in the heart of the gopis for Krishna. And that is our list. That is our message for all of us to understand or try to understand, it's very difficult to understand, try to understand the feelings of these gopis. Try to follow the footsteps of the servants of the servants of the servants of these gopis. So we may develop a trace, a very minuscule trace of that devotional service in our heart as well. When we go to Vrindavan, let us go to Raman Reti. Let's roll in the sand because that's possible, just possible that maybe there's a dust of particle, I'm sorry, a particle of dust from the lotus feet of the gopis is left somehow. And we just, just maybe, just maybe we're fortunate enough to roll over that particle of dust. That would be the ultimate benefit of our human birth. That will be the end of our mundane material existence. That will be the beginning of the rise of pure love in our heart for Krishna. What more can we ask for? So with that, I'm going to pause and invite any questions or comments you have before we close off. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I think. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. So, Prabhuji. Excellent class today. Thank you for this. I just had a question. So, was there any other reason that Lord Krishna did not went to Vrindavan other than what he said that he wants to increase the love for himself for the Gopis? Is there any other reason? I'm just thinking. The funny thing is. Shri Jiva Goswami, in his uh, very famous book called Gopal Champu, and even Srila Prabhupada, in one of the purports in the 10th canto, says Krishna did go back. Did go back, okay. He did go back. Not only he, he, he went there after killing Dantavakra, who was in Mathura. And Gopal Champu describes that at that time, Krishna married not only Radharani, but also all the billions of gopis. All at the same time. And the funniest thing was that the same Bharatis, the, the groom's party, were present in all those weddings at the same time, but thinking that they were only present in one. So at the end of those weddings, Krishna called Daruk. You know who Daruk is? 
Anybody? Who's got it? Charioteer. Yes. Thank you, Sona. He's a chariot driver. So he came with the chair. Krishna invited all the residents to sit on that chariot. So billions of them sat on that one chariot. And all went back to Golopandavan Dham. And Krishna went back to Dwarka as Vasudev Krishna to complete his pastime. Okay. So I answer your question indirectly, Prabhu. So I hope that's okay. Yes, 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 Prabhu. Anyone else? Prabhuji class is so nice that we are lost. We, we, we don't know. Actually, we are we are taking bath in that. Believe me, it's it's amazing. Thank you. It's amazing. Thank you, brother. Okay, so if there are no questions, I will stop. And again, I want to thank you for uh, patiently listening. Thank you, Prabhuji. Thank you, Mataji. Thank you, Prabhu Ji. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu Ji. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Thank you. 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 Thank you.